being autistic is who you are. It means your brain is different to other people's, well, normal people. So would you say what your diagnosis is? Um, PDA, ADHD, autism, anxiety. Everyone who's autistic is slightly different, so you have to take your time and not rush to learn about them, their interests, what they feel comfortable with, and then you can avoid that so they don't feel stressed, and then it will be easier for them to work and make more progress. And what do you think about PDA? What do you think that means? A super pal. Is there anything that you'd like to say to any children whose school might be making them feel sad? Just believe in yourself, to be honest. If you believe in yourself, you can do anything you want to do. All children want to learn, but sometimes the school environment makes this so difficult for them. It takes time to rebuild them and find a new way to learn that works. And when you get it right, they can see the future. This is Missing the Mark, a podcast about how the school system is failing autistic children. My name is Eliza Fricker. Episode 4, Seeing the Future. In this last episode of the series, I'm looking at how our broken school system is not just failing autistic young people, but everyone. What can be done to make it better? Dr Chris Bagley researches the problems and solutions of our school system. It's policed historically by Ofsted and DFE, by league tables and by accounti- accountability mechanisms like Ofsted. And young people who don't fit into that, who are not efficient, who don't achieve the standards that a school is essentially coerced into driving towards, are often pushed out. And sometimes school leaders, I don't think, do this even consciously. So they'll say things like, we're not meeting this child's needs. And what that probably means is this child isn't meeting the school's needs. And it's why... I think there's so much psychological distress in young people. This cartoon is called SEM Builders and with the subtitle Get In. And I've drawn a really rickety selection of building bricks all piled up with teachers, reading, Ofsted, management, meetings, PE assessment, training, and the building blocks that have fallen off are relationships, inclusion, individualism and curiosity. And around it I've done different builders slash teachers trying to fix this rickety pile of building blocks. And someone saying, I found the egg timers. And then another one saying, oh, this one's heavy, it's a big, big block of checklists. Someone else, I've got this, we could stick it on the side, stop the targets falling off. And finally there's there's Dave saying, what about just adding a couple of Juliet balconies? And I'm saying, for crying out loud, Dave, no, look, should we just start the whole thing again? Graham Brown Martin, public speaker and catalyst coach. How can we run a society or an education system for that matter that has no interest at all in a person's personality and how they perceive the world and how they experience the world? Somehow we've allowed ourselves to believe that the gold standard is somebody who can sit still for eight hours a day doing repetitive tasks five days a week maybe taking a weekend off and a few weeks for holiday without really questioning anything. Now, if that's the gold standard, I'm quite happy not to be part of that. A standardised system, attendance prioritised over wellbeing, teachers who have to meet targets, inflexibility, 
Even when our children have a diagnosis, they are still required to fit the system. Dr Naomi Fisher. It's not a system that can be tweaked to fit individuals because fundamentally it doesn't start with the individual and their needs. It starts with the idea that we need to put a certain amount of knowledge into the heads of children and young people. And that is the point of it all, that it's a content-focused system rather than a child-focused system. And an attendance sake. Well, that's because in order to get the content in, you have to keep attending, don't you? You have to be there so that it's not about thinking about how can I help this child or every child to develop fully into the person that they have the potential to be? How can I help them to explore themselves? How can I help them to develop the skills they're going to need as an adult? It's how can I get them to learn the things that the curriculum says is important? It's a really different perspective that they're coming from. It's very hard to marry up the two things. If your focus is content, then, you know, the content is always going to be more important than the individual because that's the point. The stats show this approach isn't working for anyone. Dr Chris Bagley. And if you compare the UK's children, particularly English children, to those in other countries of Northern Europe, when you look at the OECD data, World Health Organization, stuff coming from the Children's Society, UNICEF. English children fare extremely poorly in terms of their school satisfaction, life satisfaction, subjective well-being. That's across all young people. So the data is telling us that on average, across young people, this isn't just a send problem, this difficulty with school satisfaction and subjective well-being, which is very significant in England, is impacting across the board. And at States of Mind for the last three or four years, we spoke to hundreds of young people across a number of schools in London boroughs. We're finding that the young people who are academically able, who theoretically succeed, in inverted commas, from the education system and go to universities like Manchester and Oxford, they're saying exactly the same things that the students are saying to me when I'm in the prison environment. According to Tom Vodden, our prisons are full of those whose needs were missed at school. We've got an extremely high number of our prison population who have been failed by the education system because at the point at which it was needed, the investment wasn't there. So we try and kick it down the road, see whether we can get away with it, so we then end up with a situation where we're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds to incarcerate somebody on a monthly basis for years and years and years and years. I started to think there must be more to this. I started to meet more parents in the same position, whose paths and stories followed a very similar and no less grim trajectory. And as I heard their stories, I started to wonder Perhaps it wasn't us, me. Perhaps we need to look at the system as a whole and ask who is it working for? Dr Chris Bagley. So we have two options. Either we go, we're just going to ignore what the young people are saying and all the international local data and the views of young people, or we're going to do something. I think the main thing that we have with some real strength of our system, actually, is lots of very dedicated and very skilled teachers. I think one of the things that I really notice when I work with most teachers, teachers are saying the same things as the students, which is fascinating. They're saying the same issues around life skills, identity, mental health, personal development are at root of the problems. They're saying the same things as the students. So I think there is lots of strengths in the education system around skilled professionals who want to help, but they're very much hamstrung by an incredibly inflexible system. The issue probably we have at the moment is it's hallowed ground the education system. It feels very self-evident. It feels like common sense. Everyone's been through the education system. This has become much bigger than I thought it would be. It has become about how we parent, how we think about difference, our education system. It started out about my child, but now I'm part of a community of others who share these experiences and who want more and different for our future generations. We think we could do better for them, for all children, 
with or without diagnosis. I talk to so many parents who talk about seeing their children fail and feeling helpless. Often we spend many years chasing solutions that aren't there. What if the system worked differently? What could that look like? Harry Thompson, Autism Advocate. I think we need to go back to basics. I think we need to see ourselves not as educators, but students. What does it mean to educate someone? What are we doing? What are we teaching them? Is it not important, first and foremost, to understand the child? I cannot see myself as the educator until I understand the child. And from there, it's easier to know what to do. And granted, it's going to be very difficult to do this to every child. They always say that, oh, there's 30 children in the room, you know. And this is the problem. Educator Tom Vodden. There has to be some degree to which people look at it and decide that they're going to try to be more creative in their response. And that that requires, in a lot of cases, courage to do that. The idea that learning has to take place in a classroom environment, for example, and it starts when it starts for everybody else at 8.45 and it finishes at 3 o'clock, that model can be challenged. The thing is, is that often people look at schools and see that there is a social element to schooling that cannot be replaced in any other way. But actually, the social element of schooling for some children in the way that it is currently set up is actually part of the problem and that the the learning element of what goes on in school for some children can be far more successful if it is done on an online environment. Dr Naomi Fisher. There's a kind of belief that school is benign, school is good. You know, that raising money for schools is always a good thing. More kids in school is a good thing. And that's questioned so rarely, you know, whether this is really the best thing to do for lots of children and whether we should be putting them through this model because we believe that that is the best way to spend a childhood. Because that's the other thing about it, is that this is your childhood, it's your one and only childhood. Is that the best place for you to be spending it? Why are so many children struggling in that environment? It has got stricter. There is a lack of autonomy for the teacher in the classroom to bring their personality into that classroom to personalise those lessons, to go with the flow. You know, I've got family who were teachers years ago and they said, you know, if the children were flagging, then we could just take them outside and do something. There isn't. Everything is so restricted within a curriculum and it's so target-driven that the actual people, the children that it is for, have been lost in this. There is not that space for children to really learn about themselves and to develop in a way that works for them at a time that works for them. We're not doing strength-based learning. And I think that it's probably harder now because it's even less reflective of their lives and the society outside of that classroom. I think if you look at how we're working as adults and our day, you know, how many of us now are all getting up at that that time and putting on a suit and going to work? How relevant is it to children and the rest of their lives? We're parenting differently. I don't think we should have a system by which you have to be diagnosed with something in order to get an alternative way of education because loads of people don't thrive in our current educational system. And I think we need a way for that to be recognised and for us all to think about education in a much wider way. So my ideal would really be if when children are going to school age four or five, it's not a question of which school do they go to. It's a question of how are they best going to learn. We need to be widening our view of how people can get an education and we need to be allowing people to do things at different times because I think one of the really destructive things about the current model is it expects people to be able to do things at a particular age. And 
that, that, that sits very poorly with me, that we measure development and say you're not doing these things at this age everybody else is doing them. So therefore, there's something wrong with you. Currently, we locate the problem in the child. My child was termed special educational needs, which said there was something wrong. Who wants to stand out for the wrong reasons? But I now knew there wasn't anything wrong. I learnt that once we were at home. They became calm, engaged and could be themselves again. And they were learning. What if learning was also about more understanding of ourselves and our differences? I put this to Graham Brown Martin. And this is what I think would be so valuable in a, in a new way of learning, in a new education system. Create a place where not the, very much not that we remove diagnosis because it's really important to know about ourselves, but we learn about it in a validating way. So we learn about ourselves and the way that we work so that we don't become adults who are still really unsure about ourselves and how we need to work. That's where I think so much isn't valued in learning. Learning should be about ourselves. Yeah, you've completely nailed it. And it absolutely nailed it. I mean, if you look at the Harvard Longitudinal Study, which is the longest study of, of what it takes to live well in the world, hundreds of people that are now in their 90s, what they discovered was it isn't about, you know, the, how much money you earn, what car you drive, where you live. The, the key to a, a, a living well in the world, to be healthy and happy, is good relationships. There's nothing in our education system that works towards it, nothing at all in any of them. And I, you know, that's the that's real problem because obviously the, the collateral impact of, of doing it properly in terms of healthcare and those kind of things, and just joy is remarkable. What do the children think? I asked them what the perfect school would look like. They were all similar. Oh, it'll be in a tree house and it would have a zip line to get in and it'll have a door through the roof and it'll be one classroom and anyone could sit wherever they like. They could even hang upside down. And pretty achievable. Lots of animals, um, a nice big open school with a lot of trees so kids can climb the trees. But obviously with mats under them, like some soft stuff. And um, probably had lots of leaves to make them like little like a den. They wouldn't be forced to do anything and it'll be right by a field so they could play in a giant field and have an exercise out so they could concentrate. I want there to be like snakes, dogs, like therapy dogs. Guinea pigs, hamsters and that. All children are our future and they have something to contribute. Graham Brown Martin. If we are going to survive as a species into the next century and beyond, it's not going to happen if we just all think the same and we rely on our education systems, which were broken years ago. Uh, they are insufficient for solving the challenges of the future. Personality. And neurodiversity is, is not a line, it's a sphere. And it's, really like it's an expanding sphere. And actually, pretty much all of that stuff is useful in one form or the other. And actually, building a society which supports all of those people and values all of those people. Neurodiversity is the idea that all humans are different, and this diversity is a strength, not a weakness. We need people with finer attention to detail, who are highly sensitive to changes. We need diversity because how much do we lose when people who are different are seen as failures of the system? And when we think about these numbers in the, in, the, in the prison population, for example, how many of those are the ones that could potentially save the planet in terms of reversing climate change? How many children have we set up to fail? But when you think for all of those people that, that, that we we know about and, and that we put on pedestals, whether they're artists or inventors or entrepreneurs or whatever, who are also neurodiverse. You know, there are, you know, orders of magnitude uh, of numbers of those people lying within our prison systems because we didn't catch them early. Throughout the making of this series, the overlap has become clear between exclusion, forced out and prison those who have the resources to fight it, and those, for whatever reason, don't. That could have been us. Dr Chris Bagley again. 
It's really difficult, to be honest with you, when I'm working with young people in the prison context, we've almost always been kicked out of school. We've almost always experienced a lot of trauma. Chris provides support for these young people. They have a sense of safe space where they're valued and they're wanted and they can develop relationships with people. They can start to reconsider who they are. They can start to think of a different future. And when they feel that they're wanted and worthy, that they will tend to opt into eventually. So you can't get away from the fact that we live in a society where you do need some literacy. You, know, you do need some academic skills. So the difficult balance for me that, that can work really well is if they feel competent in certain areas, if they feel that they have some autonomy and they have some control over what's going on for them, and they feel connected to each other and they feel a sense of belonging, you can think about positive futures with them. And you can also help them to recognise why some aspects of the academic schooling is important. And you can do that in a way that doesn't force them. You can do that in a way where it links with their future. So most young people want to do something in the future. Some will say, I don't care, this is pointless, but that's because they have such a low sense of self. So I guess the hopeful thing for me is educators have an enormous amount of power to work with these young people, even when they are pushing you away really, really hard. Because if someone's pushing you away like that, there's a reason they're doing that. That behaviour is communicating something. Every young person I've ever worked with, when they perceive that there's a value in learning, they will learn. No child cannot learn. And everybody wants to learn, really. I asked Liz Soper from a seat at the table, if she had a magic wand, what would she change? We know that children learn in many different ways. And, you know, some of us are more visual, um, some of us more practical, some of us like, you know, written information. So we need to embrace what we know about children and personalise things where we can. Everybody's different. It's not possible for everybody to just sit still, be quiet and concentrate for long periods of time. There's smaller things that don't cost anything, such as just kindness and flexibility, you know, creating better relationships between parents and teachers and, and young people. So to create that like triad and, you know, to maintain that communication and connection, you know, and listen to each other. And I found I could look at things differently once I connected with those others who were also looking for alternatives. I discovered there was support from those who are also doing things differently. Kieran Rose. So we're creating our own support services, we're creating our own support networks and you can see that amongst autistic people, the amount of autistic-led organisations and charities that are popping up all over the UK. And it's happening wider and wider all over the world as well. So I think that's where my positivity lies, that autonomy is starting to exist amongst autistic people. We're starting to recognise that we have to, have to make our own choices. But being able to move away to find people who get us, and that has been huge because I think there was that absolute feeling of loneliness when we were in that system and so finding people now that get it and get us has meant I can explore my own neurodivergence I can understand a lot more about all of that stuff that was around us and it's created a much safer place for all of us as a family which we didn't have before we felt very other in that environment because it wasn't safe it didn't feel safe for any of us there was no one there was no one like you or the other people in our community to talk to when we were in that system it was just people telling us how to change to fit the system things now that you and I are going through and what so many other parents are going through in terms of having to find the right support, of having to extract our children from systems which are harming them and avoiding those kind of narratives. So there's levels of trauma there that are being applied to families who have no understanding of themselves, who have no understanding that there could possibly be another way, that you don't have to rely on these systems. But unfortunately, by the time they come to that realisation, they're already really embedded in those systems. 
When we were in the system, we didn't know any of this. We couldn't imagine another life or another way. We were trying to fit in, make our child go to school and appear okay when they were not. And the future looked bleak. I can honestly say I couldn't, I couldn't look and I couldn't see the future before when we were in the system of school. I couldn't. But I think with that restoration that's been done at home, and seeing that difference that's made and having a calm person that I live in a house with now. Yeah. That's, yeah, I wouldn't go back for any love nor money to what it was like before. Um, everyone was miserable and everyone was just surviving. Yeah. I mean, some days are still really hard and I probably will perennially worry about the onlookers. Do you feel positive about the future? Do you feel like you can peg the way it will go? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, I see with age as auto autonomy comes into play more and more, you know, them getting on the bus, going to meet for it. Sleepover has now happened. You know, we couldn't, you know, so these things now happen and they happen because they want them to happen, not because... You know, they feel they need to. They're doing it now in a way that they feel really safe and secure. So seeing those things start to happen. And I just think, you know, the more sort of understanding about ourselves on the journey, because I keep thinking about how much of this has to come from the adults. So whether it's, you know, in, in learning in school or with parents, all that work around post-diagnosis has to come from us. So I think that those milestones that we're meant to get to, we get there when we get there. We could all do so much better. We deserve so much better. And it is, it's everybody who deserves better. And, and we are incredibly disabled by the system, not by our disabilities. What is your positive from this experience that you feel you are in a place that you are now that you weren't in a few years ago? I feel positive because of people like Harry and people like you and meeting kind of a tribe of people who understand my journey and I understand yours. And so there's a lot of not having to say and not having to explain. And the, the joy of that is huge. From finding these people, stuff is growing. There's green shoots. There's more and more now that people are understanding it. And, and being able to kind of project forward with certainty, really, about my son, that he's going to do something really sensational at some point. I don't know when, but it'll be when his brain is ready or his nervous system is ready or something. He's like a sponge at the moment without the pressure to learn. He's learning such a huge amount. And at some point, the green shoots are kind of going to really take over and he will be, you know, kind of this amazing sort of flowering garden like being able to drive, like getting a job or doing the job, even if it's something that is kind of, you know, self-employed. I see him being able to live independently. Like all of those, all of these things, if they don't happen, are absolutely fine because he can still stay home with mum. But I do foresee a really, really bright, rich future. And I am not worried. This cartoon is called Going Out. I'm boiling a kettle and my child is saying, I'm going out now. And they're not even in the picture, it's just the speech bubble. 
and I'm saying, okay, have fun. And I've got a thought bubble above my head that is a heart. And there's not a lot in there, but it's that simplicity. It's just a small but huge step for us. And it's being done in a relaxed way and completely with their own autonomy over it. They just want to do this now for themselves. And it's a really lovely thing to see happening in our lives. It's funny when you look at the cartoon I showed earlier where her hand is wrapped tightly around my bag strap to this cartoon with all this space around it as she just floats off out with ease. Um, it's such a contrast to where we were, to where we are now. Do you have to do a GCSE on your birthday? Mm. Yeah. Do you actually? Yeah. That is so exciting. Right. Which one? English. Are you, are you going to Thorpe Park? No. I always think about who my child was before starting school and how they changed and shut off over the years. I think about how unwell they became in that place that none of us are meant to question. School is school. The majority go, and those that struggle, we must find ways to get them to attend. Now they are happy. Oh, no. Genuinely She's happy. While diagnosis should be empowering and validating for the individual, in our school system it is still othering, and in the end, our children still must fit. We put so much on our children, on families. What if there could be another way? Like eight June or July. When goals are based around fitting in and managing one environment, this puts the emphasis on the child to change. The message is it's their responsibility, or ours, to change them to be like everyone else. But what if instead we did the work? The schools, the carers, the teachers, the parents. What if we said, what do they need? What will make you feel safe, secure, and in turn more confident? But we fall into a narrative of fix to fit. <laughs> We've been sold normal. What will they become? What about the real world? We worry about attendance, the future, judgment, our parenting, because everyone goes to school. We see the headlines, and this is what we fear. But actually, when we look at the basis for the miserable or unfortunate outcomes, these come from sadness, mental health, addiction, instability, sometimes even cruelty. What if we provide emotional understanding, stability, safety, love, consistency first and foremost, protection from the othering, the bad narratives? What if we provide positivity, nurture? These are the foundations to thrive. This is safety. What works for you? What do you need me to do? I will learn as the adult to flex and adapt to help you with this. Would we need supports, EHCPs, special and expensive court cases to secure an education? Would we have long wait times for mental health support for children? Would we have less of this fixing because we would have less that needed to be fixed? Missing the Mark was written and produced by me, Eliza Fricker. The executive producer was Eve Streeter and the sound designer was Simon James. Music in this series was kindly donated by Kate Brooks, The Relations, Sim, Sean Julian, Tess Roby, John Ty, Abby Wade, Joel Wells and Simon James. The series was funded by Necessity, a living archive rooted in social and environmental justice. Thank you to everyone who's taken part, especially the kids and their families. Yeah.